Welcome to Crash Concepts, where the economy, energy, and the environment are explored. Up next, fresh ideas and insights into the factors that are driving the world and shaping your future. Presenting information you can't afford to live without, here's Chris Martinson. Welcome to this Peak Prosperity Podcast. I am your host, Chris Martinson. You know, as tensions between the West, by which I principally mean the U.S., the U.K., and Europe, and Russia, ratchet ever higher, so do the stakes. Now, listening to Western mainstream media will leave you worse off for your efforts because too much essential context is almost always missing. The Ukrainian war did not start in a vacuum a few months ago. Now, despite a lot of complexity and the enormous risks of poking sharp sticks at a potentially dangerous bear, the U.S. and Europe have been doing just that, blaming Putin personally, targeting people close to him for sanctions, and now levying economic sanctions on all of Russia. Today we're speaking with a guest I am especially keen to interview on this subject, Mr. David Stockman, economic policymaker, politician, and financier. As I'm sure you know, Mr. Stockman served as the director of the Office of Management and Budget in the Reagan administration and was the youngest cabinet member of the 20th century. Since then, he's held executive positions in many of the most influential banking and bio and private equity firms, including Blackstone and Solomon Brothers. He is the author of The Great Deformation, which if you haven't read it, you really should. It came out in April 2013. It's blunt, sometimes delightfully and deservedly scathing of the various fiscal and policy blunders that have degraded our current and future hopes for prosperity. Welcome back to the program, David. Very happy to be back with you, Chris. Well, we're going to discuss Ukraine today, so let's start with this. I have to confess, I didn't believe President Obama when he recently said that the most recent sanctions against Russia were about, quote, standing up for the rights and freedom of people around the world, unquote. So the question is, what compelling U.S. interests are at stake over which flag flies over Crimea or even eastern Ukraine? Well, I would say none at all, but I think as we look at this, you need to have wider context. And I would like to suggest that I believe if you look at all the, uh, you know, the entire radar screen of things developing both domestically and international, that we are indeed plunging into a perfect storm of policy failure. The American imperium is collapsing. There's blowback everywhere. The wreckage of prior policy mistakes of our interventionist foreign policy is coming home to roost, and the Ukraine is, is one area of ground zero for that. But secondly, monetary central planning uh, is now coming uh, to a dead end. It has inflated the third financial bubble of this century, and the Fed is now clueless as to uh, how it manages to unwind this massive balance sheet expansion that's uh, been undertaken. And third, the fiscal doomsday machine continues to crank on. Washington is ignoring the fact that we're six years into a business cycle expansion and we're still running massive deficits and there's no cushion for the next, uh, you know, upset that comes to the economy. Now, why is all this important? Because I think the foreign policy failures, uh, uh, the collapse of the American imperium, imperium, as I call it, uh, is at the center of this, and it will push all of these things in the wrong direction. Uh, we are now becoming much more aggressive in our foreign policy than ever before. We can't afford it by any means, and the potential for this to uh, create black swans, to royal or dislocate these very fragile financial markets that have been created by uh, this massive central bank uh, uh, balance sheet expansion uh, and liquidity uh, provision uh, makes uh, what's happening in the Ukraine or what's happening in the Middle East uh, on the Gaza or in the uh, collapse of Iraq uh, even more uh, uh, dangerous in terms of uh, what it could trigger. So we're, we're in a real pickle here, and uh, I think it's, you know, compounding by the day. I certainly agree, and, and there's extraordinary risks, and I want to get to those in a minute. First, I want to rewind the clock a little bit and give people 
the appropriate context for the story. I think much of the story begins in 1989. James Baker, then Secretary of State, was sitting down with Gorbachev. They're trying to carve out a mutually agreeable diplomatic solution to the conundrum of how to go about removing USSR troops and influence out of East Germany so that that reunification could go forward. What happened then? What was said? What was promised? And why is that important? Yeah, I think that's a very important inflection point in simple uh, terms, Baker said that in return for Gorbachev's and Soviet cooperation in uh, withdrawing from East Germany and permitting the unification to go forward, the U.S. would pledge that NATO would not expand by a single inch. And that was uh, a solemn commitment, and frankly, that made sense. Because if the Cold War was drawing to a close, if the Soviet Union was in the final throes of its uh, collapse, which by then was becoming more evident, then the purpose, the very purpose of NATO uh, uh, had passed. And the uh, right thing to have uh, to do at that point going into the 1990s was to figure out how to uh, shrink and dismantle and eventually uh, eliminate uh, NATO, just as the Warsaw Pact was being dissolved on the other side. Well, history um, took us in exactly the opposite direction, to a mindless expansion of a military alliance that was obsolete after August 1991, when the Soviet Union uh, literally uh, dissolved. And uh, we had, at that point in time, There were 16 nations in NATO, uh, and today there are 28. And we have added all these tiny microstates and have encroached deeper and deeper uh, into Eastern Europe until eventually we were on the doorstep of Russia. And I think that uh, is what has precipitated this unexpected and uh, very uh, precarious or dangerous uh, confrontation that we have at the moment uh, over the Ukraine. Well, this is important. Ukraine was really pretty much the the last game piece on the table. Uh, NATO had pretty much expanded uh, pretty much all around all of that. So as we shift forward in time, former President Yanukovych, uh, there's another key pivotal moment. He was kind of sitting on the fence last fall, as, as I have the story. In fall of 2013, I think it was November, he was supposed to sign the European Association Agreement, which is a, an economic agreement, which he most famously did not. I think he showed up to the conference and basically uh, uh, punted at that point, did not sign that. Instead, he turned back towards Russia. I'm thinking that tweaked a few noses at the State Department. Yes, it did. And it also was in the context of the uh, huge mistake that Obama made in August last year when they proclaimed that the chemical weapons which had been used in Damascus uh, had been launched by the regime. There was no question about it. It was uh, black and white, and that he was on the verge of uh, launching the airstrikes, as you remember. Mm -hmm. At the last minute, withdrew. Putin stepped in, came in with a much better solution, and that was uh, the uh, ultimate disposal of all the uh, chemical weapons by the Assad regime. And I think that really stirred uh, the neocons and what you might call the uh, expansionist foreign policy uh, network in Washington into action. And you can look at the uh, news uh, over the period after uh, Obama was forced to retreat, and it was a good thing that he did. It would have been you know, a total mistake uh, to start lobbing bombs into Syria, a situation that's uh, totally combustible and unstable and really none of our business. But in any event, after that, the uh, drumbeat began to get louder and louder about Putin and Russia and the situation in the Ukraine. Uh, I think clearly the evidence is that uh, U.S., um, Agents were heavily involved in the street demonstrations and then effectively the coup d'etat that occurred uh, in February. Uh, A new government uh, was installed. The constitutionally elected government was uh, thrown out. The elected president had to flee. 
And uh, you brought into power some pretty unsavory people in terms of a uh, ideology which is almost neo-fascist uh, in its history and in its uh, posture, and it created enormous tensions in the Ukraine because the eastern side of Ukraine is Russian, Russian speaking, and has been oriented uh, to Moscow for decades, uh, if not um, centuries, and it created uh, another, uh, you know possibility of ethnic clash and ethnic cleansing, which uh, began then to mobilize uh, the resistance, uh, the rebellion uh, on the eastern side of the country in the Donbass region. One thing led to another. Uh, we didn't uh, have any, uh, show any uh, sensitivity to that in Washington and the State Department and instead uh, treated the Ukraine as a sovereign country that had the right to go in and put down a rebellion. We've encouraged them to do that. And so now you have the armed clash uh, in the Donbass region today right on Russia's doorstep. So what I'm saying is in the big picture, NATO shouldn't have been expanded. In more recent times, there was no reason why the elected government of the Ukraine couldn't decide to try to do a deal with Russia uh, that it found more attractive than one with the West. When it came uh, time to clash on the streets and a challenge to the government, uh, we shouldn't have been there uh, encouraging and enabling and facilitating uh, that uh, destabilizing event. When the new government took power, uh, obviously, it was not sensible for us to egg them on, to encourage them, to enable them to begin uh, a major military operation against several million uh, people in the eastern regions of the country. So uh, I would say that this crisis was not made in the Kremlin, as the mainstream uh, narrative wants you to believe, but it was uh, generated, uh, gestated uh, in Washington both over the longer term and uh, because of the mistakes that we've made since the end of the Cold War, and in the near term because we've jumped into a civil conflict in a country that has never <laughs> been stable or had consistent borders, you know, for centuries and uh, is not really uh, our business uh, to try to uh, manage and, and direct. I think that's all very well said, and, and I'm wondering how much uh, getting our nose out of joint by being outfoxed by Putin, who, who, by the way, all he did was prevent us from going in and, and unnecessarily bombing uh, a, a, a sovereign nation and ostensibly trying to take out its leader, Assad, over uh, evidence that turned out not to be uh, uh, point, painting the narrative we wanted. Now, I just want to set the stage a little bit more because in our press, uh, I've seen these the people in the eastern part of Ukraine described as separatists uh, generously, terrorists ungenerously. And I want to note that they're all Russian speakers. And so there's a couple of parties that are in power in Kiev, in the western part of the state right now. And one of those is uh, Yulia Timoshenko's fatherland party. And she was caught on tape saying that the way they should deal with the eight or nine million Russian speaking citizens is to nuke them. Uh, th there's a lot of reasons why Russian speaking people would believe that they would not get a, a fair representation at best, but might even be at threat at worst. Uh, should some of the, the parties that are angling for power in the West uh, rule their lives? Is it is it fair to say that these are people who have a, a legitimate concern uh, over the kind of people who seem to be propped up in the West? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and the narrative that we have going here, that these are terrorists, that somehow they're equivalent, uh, you know, uh, to what uh, we have dealt with in the Middle East or uh, in Afghanistan, uh, is just so far uh, from the truth and, and so inaccurate uh, that it's, it's astounding. There has been ethnic conflict in the region of the Ukraine for centuries. And in more recent times during the Soviet Empire, there was a huge reshuffling of populations that was done in classic form by Stalin when a lot of Ukrainians were moved out of the east, the Donbass, the uh, Pittsburgh of the Ukraine, if you will, the mm -hmm. steel, coal, industrial, and machinery center, uh, Russian speakers were brought in because Stalin uh, was the great paranoid who 
didn't trust the Ukrainians after the uprisings of the early 30s, and for good reason. Uh, you know, you know all about the liquidation of the kulaks and so forth. And so the country today is, in, uh, in, let's say, um, enmeshed in a tremendous, convoluted, difficult, bloody history that we're ignoring entirely. But the point is, when nationalistic and neo-fascist oriented Ukrainians seized power in Kiev, that was a, you know, dramatic signal to the Russian speakers that huge trouble is ahead, the clash that has happened on and off uh, over decades and centuries was about ready to get red hot, and so they did organize themselves, and they did arm themselves, and they did uh, attempt to form a breakaway uh, Republic because uh, they didn't want to be part of this, um, you know, unconstitutional regime that took power in Kiev. Now, obviously, uh, the Donbass region has been part of the greater Russian economy and polity going back uh, centuries. Uh, and it is not something that. Uh, the leadership of Russia can just uh, totally ignore, and uh, I don't consider what they're doing a indication that they're bent on world conquest or that they're going to march uh, all the way through Eastern Europe uh, and through Poland and the Baltics and to the doorstep of Germany. All of this is just paranoid and delusional. They're concerned about the industrial region on their border that is historically an integral part of their economy and that's populated uh, with Russian speakers with whom they have, uh, uh, you know, a great affinity. And they are extremely nervous about the agitation of Washington and the West uh, in uh, Kiev and the machinations uh, of the new government and, uh, you know, it's all uh, pretty uh, understandable and plausible if you just sort out the facts and look at a little history, which, uh, you know, today the Obama administration and the leadership of the Western uh, uh, European countries just can't seem to do. Oh, David, it's such a, a breath of fresh air to be talking with you about this because uh, it, it's it, this is all information. It's all facts. There's some context here that's really important. And this brings us more or less to the present moment. So we had this tragic situation with Flight 17 being shot down. The initial knee-jerk reactions of John Kerry, Obama, Hillary Clinton, others in the State Department, our UN representative, uh, and others, were that Flight 17, that incident, was all Putin's fault, which was swiftly followed by a complete lack of evidence that has not yet been made available. So uh, here's the question. Am I wrong in assuming that if the United States had the sort of evidence that supported the current narrative, we would have released it by now? Yes, uh, absolutely. And if we haven't, there is, it's uh, totally, uh, you know, uh, implausible that we wouldn't release it. So I think the only fair judgment is that we have no clear case. The larger point is there is an uh, armed clash going on. There is a serious, broad-ranging civil war occurring in the eastern region, in the Donbass, and uh, obviously uh, in the context of a raging civil war, it's possible that either side accidentally uh, shot down uh, that uh, uh, Flight 17. Uh, but the, the point that I think we need to uh, remember is the civil war is unnecessary. The civil war was provoked by Kiev in terms of the anti-Russian policies that it announced when the new government was formed, mm -hmm. by some of the act, you know, uh, events, occurrences that have happened since then, um, where, uh, you know, Russian populations uh, have been under military uh, assault. And the, the point is, the civil war could stop today if the uh, White House would simply tell the government in Kiev, stop, or the aid is going to stop flowing. The government of uh, the Ukraine is bankrupt. 
they have been promised $35 billion in aid from first the IMF-17, then a bunch more from the EU, and then there's some from the United States on top of that. Without that massive um, uh, umbilical cord of financial aid from the West, the government couldn't pay its bills tomorrow. And so, therefore, they are undertaking this broad-ranging military uh, operation and prosecuting this civil war only because of the aid that's coming in and only due to the acquiescence of Washington and the West. So uh, the point uh, regarding this tragedy of Flight 17 is the Civil War could have been stopped before it started. It is unnecessary that it be prolonged, that if we had any common sense, uh, we would tell them to stop, to have a ceasefire, and to organize a conference to figure out with uh, Russia and the um, warring parties how either a federation can be formed that both sides can be, live with or how the country can be partitioned uh, into more viable entities. Now, the idea that you're going to partition a country or separate the eastern region of the Donbass from the rest of the Ukraine shouldn't be so shocking if we would just look around and remember what happened elsewhere in eastern Europe. Uh, Czechoslovakia was created in 19... Uh, 19 at the Versailles conference. It was a mistake. It wasn't viable. It went through, you know, 80 years of various convolutions, but they ended up parting, and now you have the Czech Republic and you have Slovakia. Yugoslavia has been divided now into seven uh, uh, separate uh, smaller states because obviously the Catholics and the Muslims and the uh, Serbs and the uh, Albanians and all the rest of them. Uh, couldn't uh, live together. So there is nothing wrong with having a partition and a separation of these uh, uh, regions within the Ukraine, which could be done through some kind of negotiated process. Uh, why we continue to um, encourage, enable, and try to enable uh, a military solution to what is a uh, long-standing historic uh, ethnic and um, uh, regional schism uh, is really very hard to fathom. It is very hard to fathom. I'm not clear really what the game is, but here we are. And I'm looking at covers that say things like Putin's missile, uh, Economist has Putin on the cover with a web of lies is their main title. Newsweek's got a, a very, very dire looking picture of him with mushroom clouds and the reflection of sunglasses with the words, the pariah. Uh, all of this uh, really seems to uh, be boxing Putin, particularly Russian generally, and and into a corner. So here we are. Russia's heavily marginalized. Does this escalate further, or does it begin to de-escalate from here? Well, uh, you would hope it's going to de-escalate, but I'm amazed that it's gone this far. That Putin has been demonized to the degree that he has. That that the very complex situation has been turned into this silly black-and-white caricature that is almost uh, reminds you of the yellow journalism, the Hearst newspapers of 1998, uh, or 1898, I mean, in the, mm -hmm. you know, the prosecution of the Spanish-American War. Uh, just think about this. Putin has been in office or power since 1999, 15 years. Go back, dial back even um, three or four years ago, no one was characterizing him as some kind of power-hungry, mini-Hitler uh, bent on conquest and expansion and that has to be stopped at peril uh, uh, to the West. There, there wasn't that hue and cry. There wasn't that caricature. Yes, there was differences along the way, and there were certain flashpoints like the... Uh, Georgia conflict in um, 208, but the whole uh, image, imagery that's developed that you describe in those uh, cover stories is really made out of whole cloth in the last 6 to 12 months. And I say it was really crystallized and catalyzed uh, when Putin essentially stepped into the breach uh, in the uh, Syria uh, uh, event in August and September and helped the world move 
in a more constructive direction. And the, basically, the war machine in Washington, uh, I call it the warfare state, couldn't abide by uh, couldn't abide that. There are just too many people that um, uh, operate in the devil's workshop, which is to say we have all of this capacity, we have all this machinery uh, of war making and of intervention and of uh, global empire that's obsolete, unnecessary, and yet it's manned by people who want something to do, uh, who need to justify budgets, who need to pursue and prosecute missions. And that's what I think uh, is happening at the present time. It's just the warfare state machinery uh, has gotten itself uh, activated into motion, and it's uh, drastically uh, simplifying the real facts that we face and creating a narrative that is, you know, uh, really preposterous uh, in terms of what our real national security and what the safety and security of the American people really requires at the, in this circumstance. Very well said. So a uh, quick aside, I, I didn't intend to go here, but, but you've raised it, and I, I really, it's very important to me. The Fourth Estate, What is where is our press? I, I thought after all the mea culpas, gosh, we were so badly misled uh, in the Iraq situation. Look, we, we helped spin propaganda and lies out of the Office of Special Plans, uh, you know, Feith Pearl and Rumsfeld's special little uh, cook chamber there where they came up with, with falsified WMD information on Iraq. I thought after that that, that we might have seen a, a bit more circumspection and maybe investigation on the part of, of journalists. I'm not seeing it. Not in the Washington Post, New York Times, none of them. They are just going straight out with the main narrative. Uh, do we have a fourth estate that's useful anymore in the mainstream press? Well, that's a great question, and I think it just reveals the degree of partisanship that uh, prevails uh, in the fourth estate in the mainstream press notwithstanding all of their uh, protestations uh, of uh, nonpartisanship and uh, balanced, <laughs> fair and balanced, and so forth. So what we have now is the conservative press, the Fox News, always looking for an opportunity to have a confrontation, to flex muscles, to mobilize the machinery of the warfare state. And so Putin makes for a wonderful new uh, target, uh, you know, of attack. But on the other hand, the middle of the road in uh, liberal press, let's say CNN and MSNBC, if we want to talk about uh, the, the cable channels, um, are so um, focused on, uh, you know, currying favor with the Obama White House that they're essentially uh, re repeating the talking points that are sent over uh, from the State Department or from uh, the White House or DOD. They are literally rebroadcasting talking points and unwilling to challenge the uh, incumbent administration. So essentially, uh, both sides of the press, the so-called conservatives and the so-called middle and uh, left, uh, are neutralized, and we're getting... Um, you know, no uh, serious uh, uh, digging into the complexities uh, or history of, the, of these uh, uh, situations, um, and instead, um, the you know the kind of uh, uh, silly. Uh, presentations that uh, we're getting nightly at the present time. You want to talk about silly, let's talk about a very serious allegation that was made. It was the assertion that Russia had fired across its border with both artillery and rockets into Ukraine, had caused damage and death. That's a very serious allegation, and, and the substance for that allegation, which CNN repeated quite breathlessly for a number of days, was a series of images that came not from U.S. spy satellites or, or intelligence services. It came from a private company called Digital Globe, and it was a couple of images, so we don't know the actual timing or provenance of those. And they were tweeted out across Jeffrey Piott's uh, Twitter account. He, the, the uh, yeah, ambassador, the ambassador yeah, but... to the Ukraine, right. Right, exactly. I, didn't we use and them? And besides that, if you looked at them, uh, they, they were indecipherable. In other words, they were, they were uh, essentially cartoon caricatures with showing big arrows coming from one fuzzy spot on the... Uh, uh, on the uh, picture uh, to the other, and, and who knows when, uh, what point in time uh, those were taken, what really was on either end of those arrows. I think it's a lot of nonsense that it isn't even close to the kind of intelligence we really have, and if they had it, 
they believe me, they would be uh, declassifying it and, and making it public. You know, you can't even get f- facts such as these. The um, Buke system, so-called uh, anti-aircraft uh, uh, system launcher, is being blamed for bringing down Flight 17, and maybe that's uh, going to prove to be correct after real evidence comes in. But what they don't tell you, and they say that is a Russian-made system, and so therefore the viewer is left to judge, well, Russia must be behind that. No, the entire Ukrainian military equipment uh, is Russian because the Ukraine was an integral part of the Soviet military machine until uh, the Soviet Union finally ended. And the Ukraine to this day has 60 Buke anti-missile systems, uh, and maybe the rebels got their hands on one or two when various units of the Ukrainian military defected. But you don't uh, get uh, the facts that there are 60 uh, of these units under the control of the Ukrainian military, that apparently, according to the data that was presented in the press conference by the Russians uh, last week, uh, four of these systems were brought very close uh, to the uh, battle uh, uh, front uh, before Flight 17 was shot down. And so I think, you know, it's totally unclear at this point (laughs) how this uh, tragedy happened but the simple solution that it was probably a Buke missile and they're made by Russia and therefore Putin is behind it is, uh, you know, unbelievably superficial, but it's uh, essentially the narrative that you're getting from the uh, cable news today. And particularly, uh, um, I would be especially critical of CNN. You might as well label it the War Channel. <laughs> um, their Their coverage is just shockingly um, superficial and one-sided. You know, David, I was, uh, I particularly thought that for the number one purveyor of armed systems in the world, which is the United States, to say that you bear responsibility for whatever happens with those weapon systems, regardless of how or who uses them in the future, uh, seems to be a kind of a dangerous slope to, to wander down. Uh, you know, it's, uh, as you mentioned, the, there are a bunch of these systems. We don't know who used them at this point in time. We don't know if it was accidental. We don't know if it was intentional. But a very serious question that Russia raised is the fact that they had and released evidence, uh, photographs showing that there were multiple Buke 1 missile systems in the area and further that the radar was operational on July 15th, 16th, 17th, and then went quiet on the 18th after the shoot down, and that all of these were under the control of Kiev. So seems like a good investigation would say uh, we have some questions there. And, and, you know, this just goes to show uh, it raises a point here for me, which is I think Russia has actually been demonstrating considerable restraint so far. But now we've just had this next layer of, of sanctions come down from both uh, Europe and, and the U.S. And, and you might say, listen, that they're not actually all that severe, but it is another layer of, of sanctions. I would like to get your point of view on uh, let's talk about what Russia's response might finally be when they do have one and what the consequences of, of those responses could be. Well, first of all, uh, the sanctions are really uh, stupid, number one, and a joke, number two. Uh, As far as I can remember, we've never, uh, uh, you know, isolated individual members of a regime by name uh, and uh, attempted to uh, put them on double probation, so to speak. (laughs) But that's, you know, the sum sum and substance of much of what we're doing is, you know, picking uh, uh, fights with Putin's inner circle and even his outer circle and maybe even some people he doesn't know. So the first thing is this isn't very serious. It's kind of kid stuff. It's people sitting around in Washington trying to come up with a response but not wanting uh, to uh, go too far uh, with, uh, you know, real uh, confrontation. And so they uh, invent all of these games uh, which do nothing but uh, cloud the situation and intensify the conflict between the two sides, but are not going to have much real impact. Uh, some of the uh, Russian oligarchs are not going to be able to buy another $60 million high-rise apartment in midtown New York, but uh, that uh, is not going to crimp their style in the long run. 
Now, they're trying to move uh, to something more serious right now, but I- even when you look at what they've proposed, you know, it's more form than substance, uh, that uh, we're not going to allow uh, military um, exports uh, to the Soviet Union, except that only applies to new contracts. <laughs> and so, therefore, everything that's in the pipeline right now will continue. Uh, spare parts and repair parts for any systems that have been bought in the past uh, can continue to flow. Or we're going to restrict um, the uh, export of high-technology oil field equipment. But it's only oil fields, not gas, interestingly, mm-hmm. and it's only offshore when the massive, uh, you know, as you well know, uh, resource of Russia is uh, <laughs> onshore in the vast uh, tracts of uh, you know, the Siberia and all the other uh, oil fields. Uh, so, uh, you know, this is um, just the machinery run rampant, looking for ways uh, to prosecute a case that's wrongheaded from the beginning, but it's going to trigger reactions. It already is uh, uh, from the, uh, the Russians, and understandably so. So they're going to apparently restrict chicken imports <laughs> Uh, from the United States, and we'll have the chicken wars going again. Um, I don't think any of this re- represents the work of adults. I think it's uh, sort of juvenile delinquency uh, uh, run run loose uh, in the in the corridors of Washington D.C. It feels petulant to me too. It does not feel of the of the statesmanship of a George Kennan uh, or or James Baker who understood that diplomacy is about interests that are being balanced against consequences and that there's history both before and after uh, this moment in time. It feels rather like we want our way, we want it now. The confusing part to me that perhaps you can shed some light on is is the degree to which Europe has been following along. They have the most to lose in this story, you know, uh, of course, just because if, if somehow war or sanctions lead to the loss of gas flows, natural gas from Russia, Europe's in a world of hurt. Why do you think they're they're uh, really hewing to the U.S. policy at this point in time? Well, I think they've been very reluctant uh, co-participants in this. They have been until Flight 17 um, uh, dragging their feet. But I think uh, the emotional impact on the publics in Europe when this flight went down, and you know it was mainly Europeans who were on the flight, uh, has allowed politicians to become a little more aggressive and a little bolder and therefore more willing uh, for the short run and for the moment to acquiesce to the demands from Washington for uh, uh, escalating and an escalating level of uh, economic sanctions. But this is all in the immediate e- you know, emotional aftermath of this uh, airline uh, tragedy and one, I'm not sure how long that will last. Secondly, it's clear that what the Europeans are doing is so riddled with loopholes that that will become uh, increasingly evident uh, as regulations are written and more facts uh, come to the surface. But third, the European economy is in a very fragile state, as uh, we all know, and this could be just uh, a, a trigger, uh, a catalyst to tip it over into a new relapse uh, into recession. Uh, Obviously, before any of this really heated up, the German central bank was saying that uh, the German economy is basically going to flatline in the second quarter. Italy uh, is going to be negative. Spain is barely creeping along. So uh, France is uh, clearly unraveling. So therefore, it comes at a very delicate moment economically that has all kinds of ramifications that we could get into, and in, including calling Draghi's bluff on the on the whatever it takes quote. Because mm-hmm. if the economy relapses again as a result of uh, the you know the events uh, that are occurring on the Ukrainian front. What is he going to do? Is he really going to try to do uh, QE proper? And if so, is the Bundesbank going to acquiesce? I mean, there are huge questions here. There's been an enormous amount of speculation in the uh, uh, debt of the peripheral countries uh, based by the fast money who took 
uh, uh, Draghi at his word, but they'll reverse those traits uh, as fast as they put them on uh, if any doubt begins to arise. So, as I said at the beginning here, I think we're heading into a perfect storm of policy failure. And when I said that, I mean not only in the United States and not only with respect uh, to the Federal Reserve, but uh, this is pretty much a uh, global condition and certainly one that is, uh, you know, on the uh, uh, edge uh, in Europe uh, as uh, these uh, factors come together. They haven't really solved their fiscal problem. They've had a uh, small reprieve. The monetary uh, situation is highly uncertain uh, at the ECB, and uh, the economy is uh, likely to have at least some shock effect uh, from the uh, on you know this uh, growing, escalating uh, conflict with Russia and the sanctions that are being uh, you know tossed into the uh, mix. Well, absolutely, and very well said. With that, you know, this idea that there's a perfect storm of policy failure, I, too, happen to think that this escalates further before de-escalation. Uh, it's just been too much too fast. It feels like somebody in Washington has a point to make. And uh, I'm not sure that, that they've really calculated that Putin is not exactly a Saddam. There, there's a vast world of difference in training yeah. and power and skill between those two adversaries. But it's almost like we're treating them exactly the same, both in the court of public opinion, but also through the policies, it, it, it's like a, a cookie cutter. It really feels childish to me, uh, in, unless that's just how you do things these days. That's that's modern diplomacy. So with those risks that, that you see, uh, are you doing anything personally to insulate yourself? Is there anything we can do? Well, I think uh, the main thing you can do is stay out of the market. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, you know, stay out of harm's way. You know, there's always the assumption that uh, you're smarter than the next guy, and when the bell rings, you'll hear it before everybody else. Mm -hmm. And so, therefore, why not stay in for another 5% or another 10%, or why not uh, put on the carry trade and take the yield on the bond and fund it, you know, with uh, short-term uh, uh, cheap money. Uh, it's, uh, you know, a, a easy way to make a lot of money. But I think all of these things are exceedingly dangerous, and the financial markets have been more or less ruined by the central banks. Not only have they inflated a massive bubble now for the third time, and we can talk about, uh, uh, you know, all the indicators that measure uh, the uh, excess excesses and overvaluation, but I think what people forget is that the bubble finance of the central bank not only allows uh, asset inflation to run to incredible heights, but in the process it destroys the stabilization mechanisms of the financial markets. Financial markets work, real honest uh, financial markets work when there are is two-sided trade, when there is a short interest that is positioned so that when um, breaks occur or uh, corrections happen, the short interest comes in, covers its bets, uh, you know, harvests its profit, and creates uh, a, a breaking uh, action, a ballast in the market. But after uh, six years of uh, QE and ZERP and all the rest of it in a massive balance sheet expansion from $800 billion on the eve of Lehman to $4.4 trillion today, essentially uh, all the short interest has been blown out of the market. It isn't there. And so, there, therefore, this market is far more fragile in its internals than it would appear uh, from, you know, day-to-day -day observation. And if the break ever comes, the black swan hits from wherever, uh, and the market takes more than um, a serious, more than a uh, superficial dip that you know the fast money keeps buying, but takes a significant break. Then I think the real damage that's been done by the central banks will become quickly apparent when there are no bids on the way down, when there are no short uh, players to cover their bets because they've all been driven out of the market. So there's a lot of evils that have come from what I call monetary central planning, but I think one of the greatest is that it's destroyed two-way trade and it's destroyed the natural ballast uh, breaking 
and stabilization mechanisms that exist in honest markets. Absolutely, and if it hasn't destroyed, it's certainly heavily distorted the pricing of risk. Uh, I, right. You know, you, you mentioned what are your favorite indicators. Mine is I just look at what, what is what are junk bonds being priced at, and, and what's the issuance right. level, and what are the covenant light loans that are going out the door. And by those measures, we're just off the charts. We, we've never been yes. in more dangerous territory ever. Yes, I mean, if you look at any of those measures, what percentage uh, percentage of uh, the new uh, high yield credit is covenant light uh, compared to 207? It's much higher today. The rate of CLO creation, which is you know just another way of uh, forming uh, uh, you know speculation vehicles in the uh, uh, levered uh, loan market, uh, again um, the, the run rate of CLO issuance is even much higher than it was uh, at the bubble peak in 2007. You can you know you can look at uh, any number, uh, a whole uh, litany of these kinds of indicators, and you'll see that we've reached and exceeded in almost every case um, the peak levels that occurred just before the break 208. Uh, even today, I noticed in the last week or so that margin debt has begun uh, to rise again. It's back near its uh, May uh, peak, and as a uh, relative scale to GDP, it's at the you know highest level it's ever been, higher than 207, 208, even higher uh, than 2000. So we have plenty of indicators that the markets are fragile, uh, that they're uh, coiled up and uh, could easily break, but um, somehow we're assured by uh, Janet Yellen that um, markets are normally valued in, in most uh, cases, which you know clearly is uh, dead wrong. I, this is a huge area we don't have time to go into, but I'm really glad you brought it up because when you're talking about a perfect storm of policy failure, it, it's not sufficient just to note that we've got some geopolitical policy failures that, that we're about to, uh, maybe those chickens are coming home to roost. But at the same time, we're at the tail end of probably one of the most ill-conceived and expansionary monetary policies that the Fed, frankly, doesn't know how they're going to get out of. If you ask me today, or I think anybody, no matter how sophisticated, how is the Fed going to unwind its balance sheet? They'll tell you, A, they don't have a clue, and B, it's probably not possible, because when you're expanding your balance sheet, by definition, you are buying into a rising asset market. People love selling their stuff for a better price. When you're doing the opposite of that, by definition, you are selling those same assets back into a sinking market. People hate buying things that are going down in price. Uh, well, so it's even, uh, Chris, I think it's even worse than that because on the way up, as they inflated this bubble, the smart money uh, got on board and basically, uh, you know, uh, were front-running everything uh, the Fed was doing. So if, once they became confident that the $85 billion a month of bond buying was going to stabilize, if not uh, uh, enhance uh, the price of the bond, and they could buy it on 98% repo leverage uh, at zero carry cost, they, uh, you know, jumped in uh, hammer and tong. And so uh, the Fed then uh, had this magnetic force working with it, which is uh, the fast uh, money in the market uh, attempting uh, to uh, front run uh, the direction of Fed policy. But just think what happens if they actually begin to allow interest rates to rise or would begin to uh, attempt through one mechanism or another to shrink their balance sheet. The fast money will get on the other side of the trade just as fast as it, uh, you know, uh, rode the bubble expansion to the top, and they will sell what they think the Fed is selling. And that will cause a massive unwind of the greatest overvalued uh, market bubble in the world, which is uh, the government bond market. Well, what do we do here then? If is the is the Fed is clearly trapped? They own that balance sheet for for its duration, which is I think forever. Is is that what you're saying, or or is there some other? Yeah, way I, I think that, you know they. Of course, they're now re inventing rationalizations as to why they won't have to shrink it. If you remember when QE mm -hmm. experiment was just getting started, there was plenty of reassurances from Ver Bernanke and the other Fed speakers, don't worry, we'll know when the time has come uh, to change direction, and we'll uh, come up with the ways and means and mechanisms uh, to shrink the balance sheet 
back to a more normal uh, level. They're not saying that now. In fact, more and more you're hearing uh, from Dudley and some other uh, others who are the real uh, strategists uh, in this uh, uh, cabal, uh, cabal um, that, well, we don't really have to shrink it. We can just grow out of it over the next decade or two. But what that means is that they have out and out monetized in the order of 3.5 trillion dollars worth of government debt for literally no purpose. It caused a financial bubble that's going to break, and so that wasn't permanent. And it obviously did almost nothing for Main Street, because I say the 1% to 2% growth we've had is just the natural regenerative forces of private market capitalism working anyway. So they're going to have a hard thing to explain, and that is why did they monetize $3.5 trillion worth of debt and allow the politicians in Washington to get off the hook, kick the can down the road, and allow the fiscal situation to uh, to continue to fester and uh, drift uh, towards the wall. And that's the other point that I think I started out with, the fiscal doomsday machine. Nothing has been done. Uh, the next time we get a recession and the deficit you know, soars to $2 trillion or more, you know, we're going to be uh, in a very uh, hard way, obviously. This all has to be information that Putin is working with and also China. They all know that we're in an unsustainable fiscal situation in the West. So let, let me let me toss Japan into this story for a minute. So that's uh, UK, EU, US, Japan. And we're in a, a fiscal situation which is not even working after trillions and trillions and trillions have been expended, and this recovery is as good as it's going to get. But you're saying that when we get into the next down leg, uh, these, uh, the, the expenditure deficits explode all over again. And at that point in time, what options do we have left? Well, uh, I think you're going to, there'll be few and far between, uh, in a word. So we're delaying the day of reckoning, which means the day of reckoning when it comes is going to be uh, even more painful and traumatic, uh, disruptive and dangerous. I, I think uh, when you reach that point, um, it's going to be hard to keep monetizing uh, the, the government debt because the, you will reach a point where there's a, a loss of confidence in the central banks. And the only reason they've gotten away with this is that the trauma happened quickly in, in late 2008 they went to a radical expansionary policy which stabilized and then reinflated the financial markets. That led at least uh, Wall Street in Washington to conclude uh, that the crisis had passed. And, uh, you know, the central banks were the heroes. When this bubble collapses, they're going to be the bums. <laughs> you know, they're going to be the villains. And once uh, that happens, I think it's going to be very hard for them to pull the same, uh, you know, monetary uh, trick uh, the second time around. So there's really, a, when you say a perfect storm of policy failure, there, there's what you're talking about are some very, very large trends that have been in play for a, a long time. I mean, obviously, we've made mistakes from 2008 onwards, but to get to 2008 required a whole bunch of mistakes in the 90s. Uh, so and early 2000s. So, so do you think this this is coming to roost this calendar year, 2014, next year? When do you see this sort of uh, really unfolding? I think we're it's in the next uh, two to three years. In other words, in the run up to the 2016 election, um, it's going to become more and more evident that we have a non-functional government in Washington. Uh, that we're in deep uh, trouble in our foreign policy as these uh, uh, hot spots uh, escalate, uh, that the Fed, I think, is going to become more openly uh, divided and in uh, uh, overt conflict than ever before. And again, that is a new, that will be a new input uh, into the uh, you know, financial market, Wall Street environment. Uh, as long as uh, all the parents, uh, as long as the parents weren't fighting uh, in public, the kids were happy to believe. But once they start fighting in public, which, you know, I think is uh, going to happen as they uh, reach the point of raising interest rates and then by how much, um, uh, confidence is going to be undermined uh, on that front as well. 
Wow, you've given us a, a lot to think about. And uh, I do want to direct people to your website because you have excellent articles there. I, I read some fantastic ones recently that you posted that you wrote and others that you're, you're collecting. So it's a really great place to go. How do people get there? Uh, it's just uh, David Stockman's Contra Corner. Um, and, uh, you know, once you uh, get to the site, you can Google it easily. Um, I have a uh, uh, option uh, for a email subscription, and then once a day, everything we've published, uh, we send out in a simple uh, listed form, and uh, it's a very good way to keep up with, uh, you know, what we're uh, posting. Fantastic. Well, I advise people to do that because you have some really, really good articles there that have uh, helped me understand where we are and what's going on. And, of course, context is everything. Information is the new money. And uh, right. I, I really do hope that people uh, take advantage and, and follow you and other excellent sources that are out there. Because guess what? The mainstream media is really dropped the ball once again on us all. So, David, thank you so much for your time today. Very happy to uh, join you for the conversation. All right. Thank you.